Today we have guests from different sectors of society, all experts in their respective fields. Our guests include former Commonwealth Chair and member of the 1987 Constitutional Commission, Attorney Christian Monson. We also have with us uh, Dr. Edita Tonken Burgos, wife of the Freedom uh, of the Press icon, Joe Burgos Jr. Yung mga kabataan na rin ito may not recognize him but Estong and the like uh, would definitely have fun memories of Joe Burgos Jr. Siya rin po ang uh, ina ni Jonas Burgos. Aktibo siya sa Asian Federation Against Disappearances. Afan. At siya po ay isang active leader ng third order ng Carmelites. We have with us Mr. Sergio Ortiz Luis Jr., President of Phil Export, an active officer of the uh, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Chito Santa Romana, a Filipino who spent the best years of his life as Bureau Chief of ABC News in Beijing. So we will have a very good discussion this morning. While most media practitioners refer to incoming President Rodrigo Duterte as presumptive, the fact remains he's organizing his official family, getting people aboard the Duterte Express. The question about the members of the official family should have been asked during the debates, but nobody dared. Now the Duterte Express is taking shape, it's been said the incoming administration surely wants to hit the ground running, unlike some others who hit the ground flat on their faces. It's been said the incoming administration would like to introduce changes in the country's constitution to address the requirements of foreign business regarding land ownership and revive the death penalty. Should to kill orders will be made to put a stop to the illicit drug trade, Incoming President Duterte was quoted as saying he would look into uh, bilateral talks with China. These are the basic issues we will discuss today. So to start, let me ask uh, Chair Christian Monson, who was a member of the Constitutional Commission in 1987, as to his reactions to uh, the statements that there will be a constitutional convention to amend the Constitution. Is there really a need to amend the Constitution you made in 1987, Chairman Monson? Well, well, I was uh, I've, I've been reading the uh, the statements uh, to the press of people uh, who are part of the going to be part of the president's official party, and what strikes me, what comes out, is that they haven't really de they haven't really defined what kind of federalism they want or the powers that the federal states will have. And there's going to be a commission to figure it out uh, in the next year or two. Uh, the changing to a federal system of government is a very complex issue. Right? Uh, now, there has been no mention from the, the, uh, Mr. Duterte on whether he also wants to change the legislature, but he has made a statement that he doesn't like the unitary presidential system. Now, when we talk about changes in the constitution, I think we have to we have to agree that once you change a federal system, for example, uh, you may have to change all the other things, many things, not just the federal system. You have to change the means of changing the new constitution. And if you're in a federal system, you're not only talking about uh, the vote of the people directly. In the United States, you need three-fourths of the uh, legislatures of all the states to approve amendments, three-fourths. That means that when you shift whatever the formula is, it's not very easy to shift back. So if you're not sure of what you want, uh, to me, it's better to explore ways of meeting or fulfilling your objectives before you talk about it. Just briefly, let me just say, 
that if the objective is to give more powers, more resources, and more autonomy to the local government is, um, units, I think they should examine reading the constitution and the local government code. Because I think it can be done if that's the main objective through the local government code and other local laws if you read these things, right? Mm. And, and uh, I think this thing about changing the constitution uh, may be unnecessary and, and maybe it's better to test whether this works by merely a bit, uh, changing the local government code and other local laws. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's my general proposition on that, that federalism. That I, I, I think we have to think, think about very deeply what are the consequences of that and what are alternative ways to achieve the objective than, than changing the constitution. Now, if you have other objectives, like for example, parliamentary system, uh, parliamentary system and so on, or taking out the term provisions of the constitution so you stay in power longer, that's another matter. Mm -hmm. That's another matter. But they have to be very careful. Okay. What's your take, uh, coming from the PCCI and field export, uh, what's your take on this uh, statement that we will have to change the constitution? Well, uh, I was with the uh, constitutional convention that was formed by Jimmy uh, and uh, together with the late uh, Ting uh, Paterno, we were co-chair in the economic provision and we also, also took up uh, some issues of federalism. If I, if I remember correctly, these are some of the issues that I, I that struck my mind. First, most of the federalist uh, that was uh, federalism that was formed are uh, separated states or units and they try to put it together. In our case, we are a whole and we are going to break it down. Mm -hmm. Second issue that I remember is that the disparity between the economic situation of many of the provinces that we have regions and, uh, and of course they would like to be independent but then who's going to subsidize them? Many of them live on subsidy from the national government. Through IRA. Through IRA or whatever. Public services, education. Uh, is, is a province like Samar for instance will be able to subsidize on its own or with provinces uh, like Cebu will be willing to subsidize them uh, in a federal situation. So uh, I, I think that's a little complicated. Medyo mahirap na yun yan. The third that I remember is that in South America, there were those who moved to federalism and they were the, the countries that went haywire in, 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 for instance, in inflation to 1,000 times, 1,000 times, because every, nobody can direct what is their for, what is their monetary policy? Every 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 federal state comes out with their own policy, and therefore there is no unity in their uh, in their uh, in their monetary policy, and therefore inflation went a while. Uh -huh. uh, I, I don't know whether that is something that uh, can happen here. So I think I agree with that. So we have to really study it. My, my good bet is that when the constitutional provision comes in, they probably will move towards parliamentary, not federalism. Uh, in, yes, please. Sure. Actually, you know, there, are three fun, there are three dimensions, right? Unitary or federal, presidential or parliamentary, and in the case of the legislature, majoritarian or proportional. Those are the three combinations. So you cannot have a combination of unitary and federal. Those are mutually exclusive. Okay. Uh, in the first place, let me ask you, uh, Chair, do you think the administration really knows what they're talking about?
this time. This time. One more time. Malalim. Tinatawagan po yung operator. Sound check. <laughs> Test mic. Sound check. Ano sabi ni Willie ni Pumusin? Marami ikang patay kay Duterte. <laughs> Sound check. Test mic. And... Best mic. First ear cleaning in. Best mic. All right. Okay, na? Okay, na? Thank you. Salamat po. Oh, so, the question is, do you think the Duterte guys really know what they're talking about? Uh, well, I, uh, I, I don't want to answer that question right now because I don't know who's really advising him. But if you listen to Senator Nene Pimentel, who's a long-term advocate of federalism, what he has in mind uh, is a federal government and a presidential system with majoritarian rule, uh, rule uh, norm of uh, selection and uh, he's talking about expanding the membership in the Senate but he's still talking about existing districts will be honored so it's a presidential uh, system under the federal which is similar to the United States uh, when you look at it that way with an expanded Senate so I'm not sure exactly what they have but I think that's precisely the job of the commission that but uh, Mr. Duterte has uh, he said he will organize. It's uh -huh. precisely to sort out these issues. But once you have a constitutional commission, you will open the floodgates to other changes in the constitution. Well, that's correct. Uh, actually, uh, a constitutional convention has a life of its own once you've created it. It has a life of its own. And I would be very surprised if one person, like a president, can dictate to that uh, constitutional convention what the content will be. Marcos could do it, but he had to declare a dictatorship first. Mar Mar Marcos did that, right? Now, what I'm afraid of most is that if you have the same composition in a constitutional convention as the present Congress, uh, which is likely because it will also be voted, the delegates will be voted by the same system of districts. So the present Congress, which in 2012, had 70% of the members of Congress belong to political dynasties. So it's likely that the Constitutional Convention will be dominated by political dynasties and the fear of people who, who are uh, you know, involved in social reform is that they will change the social justice provisions of the Constitution, which is the heart of this Constitution. When, when, uh, when the people voted for uh, Mr. Duterte, the byword, the, the slogan was real change. Right? And, and the revolution 
or that the, or the radical change that the people are asking for by their vote. Social justice is the revolution. It's not federalism or parliamentarism. If you, if you look at and study the, the vote of the people, right? It's a little, it's a little person, the, you know, the little man, this shows a big man. It's the people at the ground level. It's the poor, the marginalized. And, and, and uh, the Duterte's pronouncements, uh, the underlying theme which is acceptable and which, which the, the poor like is the social justice underpinnings of his provisions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if people realize that if you have a new constitution that is framed by uh, and, and written by political dynasties, that you will have the same constitution on social justice. So there is truth to what has been said that if you translate changes coming in Filipino, it only goes to you know say, "Eto na po yung suplinyo." Change but, is coming. Yeah, but, but, the difference but, is the same. Yes, but what, what the people, especially the poor, think about when they think about change, they think about social justice and human development as the revolution that we need. And it could not have been written that way in our constitution had the members of that commission been voted according to districts because the dominant, the ones who control the vote, districts are mainly political dynasties. And this only goes to show that the golden rule applies today. He who has the gold makes the rule. And that's very sad. Mrs. Burkos, coming from where you are, uh, what's your take on the Duterte administration? Is there any difference with uh, the Aquino and the Arroyo administrations? I still cannot say if there will be a difference. But for now, any change is welcome. We have not obtained justice during the watch of uh, President Aquino. In spite of the proof, in spite of the Supreme Court ruling, Jonas is still missing. The Supreme Court ordered the military to surface my son in 2013 after uh, affirming their, the conclusion of the Court of Appeals. That he was really abducted. That it was an enforced disappearance case. He, uh, the Philippine Army has been found accountable for the disappearance. A certain Balyaga et al. were found responsible for his disappearance. And they have been ordered, the military has been ordered to surface my son or tell me what really happened. Up to now, the order has not been complied with and that's been more than two years ago. And up to now, my son is still missing. I won my case, but I lost the battle. So, so whatever change there is, I welcome it. And I hope and pray that this time, not only the case of Jonas would be resolved, but all other cases of disappearances and the culture of impunity would not end. It would, take, it would be impossible for it to end, but at least to be minimized so that there will be no more disappearances. Really? Wow. You can only sympathize and uh, say some prayers that you get justice. But looking at it, you're also a doctor of home economics uh, from Centro Escolar. Let me ask I'm you. I'm a doctor of education. A doctor of education, okay. Yeah. All right. But how do you look at the kind of programs being mentioned by the incoming administration? I wouldn't say presumptive incoming administration. I'm really more concerned about uh, the curriculum and uh, the example that the, the president, the family of the president, will be... Um, but, uh, the model that they will be presenting to the Filipino family, to the Filipino youth. And it doesn't look very bright. Kasi magaling kang magmura, ganun din ang mga anak mo siguro. Kung marami kang babae, siguro sasabi, ang, ang message doon ay eh, okay lang. So, that's uh, not the programs per se because I am not, uh, I have not, the programs are not implemented yet and uh, the people to be placed here are still being chosen, no? But I'm more concerned about the modeling because uh, children pick up so easily. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for role models in the coming administration? Yes, because uh, it's in the family where the values are developed. And this will be our future leaders. You know, during the elections, we had difficulty choosing our president. Bakit? 
kasi several generations ago, maraming dinisappear, maraming pinatay na sana ngayon magagandang kandidato. No, so, now we will take care of it. Excuse me, wala yung microphone. Pagkatawag ng operator natin, please. Uh, it's okay. okay. It's back. Um, Why we do not have to choose? May Hello. Okay. okay. Yes, please. Uh, Lakas nun. Pakisuyo. Yeah, one more time. Wala rito. The other one. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. We will bring our own sound system next week. very this thing that has happened to me now it always happens when I'm I, I'm in a press con especially when among the panelists is somebody in uniform so you were yeah, saying uh, I'm role models. saying that we need role models we need a very serious president who will give the message that he will not tolerate any kind of human rights violation because Killings and extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearance has continued since the time of Marcos. During the time of Marcos, more than 800 were disappeared. These are only the recorded ones, the reported ones. Times 10 million tons Haiti reported from the provinces. During the time of Aquino, Cory Aquino, more than 600 were reportedly disappeared. Tumuloy. Then during the time of uh, President Ramos, Less than 100, but 96 yon Reco uh, recorded, reported disappearances. And the time of Arroyo, 187, that was the time when Jonas was abducted. The time of uh, GMA. Estrada, hindi rin na exempt. 58 reported disappearances. And up to this time, 
this dispensation, more than 20, 23 to 26 were reportedly disappeared. But I know for a fact that there are more because I have been with the desaparecidos, families of disappeared, for more than nine years. Mas maraming takot mag-report. And bakit tuloy-tuloy? Kasi tuloy-tuloy din ang impunity. The, uh, the main respondents of my case, even after their names were submitted to the Department of Justice so that I could file a criminal case, at that time, passed na yung anti-enforced disappearance law, have been promoted. They have been given scholarships. The three main respondents, one of whom became the chief of the AFP, also an ESAF chief, even after I made my uh, protest before the commission on appointment saying that they are still under uh, investigation and at least wait for the investigation to be finished. Wala nangyari. They were promoted. That's why impunity continues. Oh, okay. Very sad. If very I'm... sad, but there is hope. Uh -huh. There is hope. I am still here. I am old. I'm, my bones go rickety so and so and I don't, sometimes I can't walk. But I continue. If there is there are people who continue, it's because we would like our the next generations not to inherit the problem. Mm -hmm. So if there are people out there who can still pray and continue, to. But I hope that the first person who would pray and stop this would be with the next president. Yeah, but he says in some interviews that he will be human rights. <laughs> that was what he said. Well, maybe that was his language during election time, baka mag -iba. Yeah. I always believe that there is something good in somebody's heart. If you just touch that, maybe, just in the case of Jonas, the evidences, the pieces of evidence which I re submitted to the Court of Appeals, I didn't look for them. They fell on my lap and given to me by mil people in uniform. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chito, what do you have to say about uh, the foreign policy being espoused by uh, Mr. Duterte? When it comes to foreign policy, uh, the, the incoming administration, at this point, I think the, the policy is still evolving. I think uh, the diplomats in Manila, as well as the people in Washington and Beijing, they're trying to figure out what will be the foreign policy of the administration. Because at this point, there's still no coherent foreign policy and it's because he's still forming the government he's still he just named his foreign secretary and they have to get their briefings from the government from the foreign from the department and only then will we see the foreign policy actually settle down but from the campaign period and from the recent statements after his election there are certain personal preferences that you can see already one is he will take a less adversarial position towards China. He is open to direct talks with China. When it comes to the U.S., it seems to me he will take a less accommodating, but he will not deviate from the alliance, but he will not be entirely or totally accommodating. So there will be some departure from the foreign policy of the current administration. As you know, in the Philippines presidential system, foreign policy to a great extent depends on the policy preference of the president and the foreign secretary. So the question right now is, when it comes to China, I think the issue is, will he engage in bilateral diplomacy, multilateral diplomacy, or jet ski? diplomacy and so we're trying to figure out in which direction you will go but from the from the pronouncement so far I think he will take he will promote a friendlier relations with China and he seems to be interested in promoting economic cooperation and a possible sub, uh, shelving the sovereignty issue without giving it up and his dream, apparently, is to have a train system in Mindanao and to continue with the North-South Railway. And it seems to me he's interested in the Chinese help.
for the building of this railway. So those are the, the key outlines right now emerging from his foreign policy, but we have to wait and see what the final or what the ultimate foreign policy would be based on the acts they will do in the coming months. And there are already several events that will test him in the coming months. Well, at least Mr. Aquino, the outgoing administration, has been very consistent on its hardline stand against China. What made you think that Mr. Duterte would be, in a way, softer to China? Well, the first indication is, of course, that one of the first ambassadors that he met was the Chinese ambassador. In a sense, this is consistent, even in the time of Aquino, the Chinese ambassador was also among the first ones. But at that time, the f very first one, I think, was the American ambassador. Of course, even without the proclamation, uh, Harry Thomas was there, <laughs> as if to say, this is our anointed, you don't mess with him. Of course, in the case of Duterte, the, the U.S. took a very interesting approach. They used the President Obama to make a direct phone call to Duterte instead of the American ambassador. And the, the Americans actually are going to replace their ambassador. It's almost like they're going to try to start with a clean slate uh, in terms of uh, U.S.-Philippine relations. But Duterte, I think, from, from what he has said so far, will maintain uh, U.S.-Philippine alliance, U.S.-Philippine friendship. But I think he will probably be less accommodating in terms of how the U.S. troops will operate under EDCA. By the way, EDCA, uh, one of the things that Aquino administration did was not to submit EDCA to the Senate, but rather to make it an executive agreement. Now that you have a new president, and since it's an executive agreement, Duterte has more leeway in terms of negotiating with the Americans, whether he will grant more bases, how the U.S. will operate within the country. And I think Duterte has struck a more nationalistic tone. So we'll see if he lives up to this. But there is a saying, nobody sits in Malacanang without American imprimatur, according to Renato Constantino. <laughs> Actually, Duterte's challenge is how to maintain the alliance with the U.S. and protect himself from being from, from any coup, basically how to ensure his political survival and yet open channels of communication with China. My own read of Duterte right now, and it could change, is that he's trying to strike a position somewhere between what GMA did with respect to China, a very, very close relationship, and what Aquino did, which is a very strained relationship. He's trying to position himself somewhere much better than Aquino in terms of improving relations with China, but whether he will go all the way to GMA or has he learned from the mistakes of GMA that when you deal with China, particularly with economic cooperation, the Chinese tend to throw billions at you. And it takes a very strong character not to be dazzled by the gold and the bullions. So the problem in the past with GMA was the corruption and then the, the lack of bidding and, and all the problems that, that, that engulfed the N, NBNZTE scandal, the North Rail. So the challenge for the third day, if he proceeds on this path, of better relations with China and emphasizing economic cooperation is how to keep it from the temptation of corruption. Yeah, I heard you say in one forum, uh, Chito, that the golden era of uh, Philippines-China <laughs> relations was during GMA's time. That's actually the speech of Hu Jintao. When gold literally transferred hands from one country to another. <laughs> well, was it the, the context of what you said? We may see another golden era, <laughs> but the question is, will it just be symbolically golden or literally laid in gold? Okay, thank you. Uh, Sergio, let me ask you, Mr. Ortiz Luis, what environment does the business need to keep the economy up if it is really up this time? Well, um, 
even before the election, the PCCI submitted to all the, the candidates uh, programs that we, we suggested that they take. No? Uh, the, we submitted uh, five areas, like the culture, infrastructure, uh, tourism, education, and uh, SMEs. And uh, when we analyze it, the eight-point agenda of, uh, of uh, the new government, uh, it looks like it's more or less the same. No? Uh, except for one area of CCT, we are not exactly uh, fans of CCT. No? <laughs> uh, because for us, it should, it should be more of job creation than, 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 than CCT. Anyway, uh, I think, well, there's a joke going around now that uh, all those being appointed are 70s and up. Uh, it is to replace the student council, which did not work out. No? Uh, so, so they're bringing back the professors. Uh, and and, and, uh, and we, we know more, many of these people we're comfortable with uh, many of these people uh, from the time of FBR, from the time of GMA, some of the better ones that they had. No? So to that extent, while initially we were, uh, because of our, the pronouncements, we were really worried what's coming. But uh, seeing some faces now surfacing, we don't think it will be that radical. I think it will be more or less the same. Continuous uh, the continuation of some of the economic programs, and uh, I don't think it can be uh, worse. Uh, to many but, of us, but will it be better? Is better than, than the past one. <laughs> ah, okay. So you're that optimistic? We we are, we are, well the, the worry becomes the hopeful. hopeful okay. That, uh, we what about the appointment to... of uh, Congressman Villar to DPWA? How does that sound to you? Well, uh, there's been a, a, a lot of criticism there, but uh, we don't really know whether it's qualification or whatever. And I think they're over the hump in the issue of the, of the, 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 the I think this, the, the only problem is, is the, is the, uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're being in, in, in the business, no? And, uh, I don't think uh, he will be using that uh, in, in, in behalf of his family. I think he can be independent. Okay, that's nice. We will open the floor to our friends from the media. Uh, wait, will I microphone? Pakisuyo nga sa coordinator natin kung saan napunta yung microphone. Okay, may isa. Sige. Tracy, please take charge. Uh, give due course to our friends from the media. Uh, we have friends from Kyoto, from uh, CNN, and from GMA, if I remember. And then Interaction, of course, the great Estong Reyes. Uh, ito yung sinasabing peacetime pa lang, guerrilla na. Samantalang inaayos pa yung mikrofon. Pilas ka lang, kaibigan kita. Chito, yung bang, I don't know, ha? hindi ako naliniwala sa feng shui. Pero dalawang ambassador na natin yung nagkasakit sa Beijing. Uh, ambassador Brady, I hope she's okay. And now si uh, Ambassador Basilio. So what is it in Beijing na nagkakasakit yung mga ambassadors? Uh, ano ba yun? It's the climate, the pollution or what? Ano kaya? Ano kaya? Is it the pressure? Uh, the stress, especially in the past uh, few years. Beijing is the most stressful dis diplomatic assignment now because of the current state of abnormal relations. That is one. But weather is also a factor, pollution in Beijing, and probably adjustment to win the cold weather, the winter. It, it takes a, um, <laughs> a strong person to be able to last <laughs> and to go through the stresses of the diplomatic assignment as well as the weather and the living conditions in Beijing. Yeah. Your experience of staying more than three decades in Beijing, what have you seen in the kind of leaders, from one leader to another? Uh, okay. Actually, that's an interesting question because uh, I witnessed the last five years of Mao Zedong. 
before he died. And this was the last five years of the Cultural Revolution. This was the period when China basically operated on the basis of one man rule. Uh, Mao Zedong, and when, because he was sick, his wife and the Gang of Four basically was trying to interpret what he was saying. Under Deng Xiaoping, they tried to move away from, from that. You know, the, the usual term is that they tried to move from totalitarianism and total control to a more, a softer kind of authoritarianism and almost leading to uh, a liberal type of authoritarianism, which is a contradiction in terms. But basically, if you were to compare Mao's period as like an empty glass of water under Deng Xiaoping, it became half full. There were social and economic freedoms, but political freedom was still restricted. Now the pendulum is swinging back. Under Xi Jinping, it is swinging back, not all the way, to where Mao was, but certainly heading in that direction. He is now taking over most of the decision making centralized under his control. And basically the Chinese premier has been marginalized and he has taken stronger hold over the military, the party. And so we're starting, we're seeing a swing back to a more centralized type of China. Okay. What about the kind of psyche uh, does the present Chinese leader have? Is he a war freak? Is he uh, oh, a diplomat? On, uh, Xi Jinping, his strategic calculus. Huh? Why is it that he's acting this way in the South China Sea? What is driving him? This is what I teach at the university. But, so but at I'll, least I'll what I'm going to do is in, in uh, five minutes. Xi Jinping, his main challenge is to consolidate his rule and to ensure the survival of the Communist Party. He is not a Gorbachev. He does not want to preside over the collapse of the Communist Party, just like in the Soviet Union. He wants the Communist Party to continue ruling, and he speaks of the China dream. And what is the dream that he has? It is the dream that China will recover the preeminence that it lost three, two or three centuries ago, particularly in the last century after the Opium War. So he wants to restore China to be a great power. Now, to be able to consolidate his rule, not only does he rely on economic growth, they don't have elections in China, so he has to make sure the economy keeps growing because this is how you deliver the goods to the citizens. Second. If, since the economy right now is having problems, the second resort is through nationalism, Chinese patriotism, or some would say ultra-nationalism. And so the, his actions in the South China Sea or the West Philippine Sea is in the context of what he calls recovering lost territories, territories that they have been claiming supposedly since time immemorial or since the Han Dynasty, but which they lost when China was weak and now they're trying to recover it. However, will he go all the way to war? And here is where you have to see his calculation. He will push the envelope as far as he can and that explains why he proceeded to build artificial islands. Because only in this way can he show his people that he's trying to bolster their sovereignty claim and not lose it in case they lose in the arbitration case. But at the same time, this is also his way of getting the support of the military. But he does not want to go into a war with the US because he could lose the war. And if he loses, not only will he fall from power, the Communist Party could collapse and it could be another decade or decades or another century of humiliation. So he will push, but stop when there is strong resistance. He does not want to get into a war because it will divert the attention from economic development to a war that he could lose because the U.S. is still superior militarily. And that is why when the U.S 
proceeds with its freedom of navigation operations within 12 miles of the artificial islands, you will see that they scramble jets and that they will deploy destroyers to follow. But they don't do one thing. Before, they would scramble and intercept in a very unprofessional way, almost that it, there could be a miscalculation. I mean, there could still be. But right now, they're trying to maintain their distance all in a very polite, almost, in the exchange of radio messages. However, when it's a U.S. plane, a jet, a reconnaissance plane, flying over near Hainan, then they scramble their advanced jets to be able to, to scare away or to persuade them to leave the 200-mile EEC of China. And this is where you have the possibility of a miscalculation or an accident which already happened in 2001 that precipitated the crisis in U.S.-China relations. So it's a calibrated assertiveness short of a direct confrontation with the U.S., but it's open to miscalculation because you can only calibrate so much. At the same time, though, they do not rule out the possibility of a short, sharp conflict with the U.S. or with the Philippines and Vietnam and other claimants. However, something that they can control so that it does not go all the way to a world war or a direct confrontation with the U.S. military. So that's five minutes. So you got it. Mahalaga ito. Excellent. All right. Um, Attorney Monson, I will have to ask you one sensitive question. How important is it to come up with uh, a convincing uh, announcement from the One more time. Okay. Lalit? Hindi, hindi, hindi. Japan. Hello. 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 One more time. Yan ang sinasabing enforced ear cleaning. Hello. Okay. One more time. Pwede na? Pwede na. O, sige. Jun. Yeah. Ang tanong, gaano po kahalaga yung posisyon ng pangalawang pakulo na pag-uusapan nga pagkakaroon ng canvas yung joint uh, houses of Congress? How do you look at it? As a lawyer and former Comelec chair? Uh, eh, powers of the Vice President Congresswoman Robledo was in the in the list, but of course they have to await the official canvassing that will start tomorrow. But uh, uh, I think uh, during the campaign, uh, Lenny Robledo expressed what kind of position she would be interested in, and it is uh, it is it is oversight and coordination on anti-poverty programs of the government. Had, had the Rojas, uh, Rojas won the presidency. 
but I think the equation uh, will change because of the, the president uh, is not honest. Really? So, do you think uh, we have a pro-people president in Mr. Duterte? I think so. And I think uh, he shares that uh, with uh, Lenny Robredo. Lenny Robredo has a long history of being for social justice and for uh, being, yes, she follows a, uh, a, a thinking about being pro poor and marginalized. And that is actual work that she has done. Uh, pro bono for the poor, uh, lawyering, oh, she's part of alternative law group. Yes. She has, for example, sponsored uh, bills in Congress uh, about the great reform and so on. Uh, that's, that's, that is the person you, you know from her life where her inclinations and uh, commitments are. Yeah. Uh, on the assumption that she will win the vice presidency, but if you have a bong bong uh, for vice president, then how will the equation be? I don't know, but uh, it's, the same. it's the same thing about, uh, about it's up to the president. It's up to the president. Uh, to determine uh, how the vice president will be able to help him and not just be a straight man. So the first obligation. Uh, yes. So the first of the so the first obligation of the president is not to die. <laughs> well, I don't know, but but you know, uh, I I think those conjectures have no place uh, at this time. Precisely. I, I just want to say that those of you who are interested. In what are the powers that can be devolved to local government uh, units without offending constitutional provisions? All right? Just take a look at Article 10 on the autonomous regions. What powers are being given by the Constitution itself? Right? Administrative organization, creation of sources of revenue, ancestral domain, natural resources, personal family property relations, regional, urban, rural planning development, economic, social, and tourism development, educational policies, cultural heritage, plus a general welfare clause, a clause as such other matters have been authorized by law, right, for the general welfare of the people. That same provision, general welfare provision, is in the local government code. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you read the local, the constitutional provision on the local government code, all of them, are, and most of them, are premised on law. For example, uh, when you say decentralization uh, mechanisms, we call initiative, referendum, allocation of powers, that is by law, the local government code, correct? And then they talk about, for example, uh, the power to create sources of revenue, levy, levy charges, subject to guidelines, guidelines and limitations, as the Congress may provide, just share as determined by law on the national taxes, for example, for mining, for share of mining, entitled to equitable share in a manner provided by law. Now, what laws are those? That's essentially the local government code. And for example, on mining, well, let's talk about IRA, all right? Now it's 40-60, 40 to the LGU, 60 to the national government. You can change that. You can make that 70% to the local government and 30% to the central government. And uh, according to the, uh, to the uh, constitution, uh, that this must be automatically released to them, automatically released. So it can be released at the local level, even before transmitting the funds. But of course, the IRA is not solely based on what you collect, as, as already said here by, by Mr. St. Louis property, that, the, that it includes a subsidy and transfer portion. So all, all of these things can be changed if, if the objective is more power, more resources, and more autonomy. This can be changed by the local government code, by the mining law, right? Under the Bangsamoro, 70% of the earnings of, uh, of, of mining companies will be given to the region. That's different from today. Yes. Right. But that's allowed under the constitution. 
Uh, and so all you need to do is change the mining law. Okay. Uh, on on uh, on the allocation of the uh, of the taxes, royalties, and so on of mining operations. So my question to that group of people who will determine the character and uh, the structure and whatever it is of the federalism is please study the constitution and please study the local government code. And, and my bet is that most of the things, if not all of the things you really want for local government can be solved by this. Now, if you have other objectives, that's another matter. So, what's your opinion on Mr. Duterte's take on the Bank Samoro basic? All right. Uh, Mr. Duterte and these people keep on saying that without without uh, federalism, uh, there can be no Bank Samoro law and there can be no peace, right? But if you take a look at the provisions of the law, the constitution, on the, on the autonomous regions, the powers are quite huge, many, scope of the powers. And many of these powers, be, uh, in order for it to be exercised by Bangsamoro, must be in the organic law. You cannot just um, authorize the Bangsamoro parliament to enact the laws. Not just in general, the general uh, powers being involved under the constitution. You have to unbundle. You have to unbundle this. For example, when you talk about economic, social, and tourism development, you must unbundle, unbundle these powers and say what exactly do they constitute. And in the Bangsamoro basic law, there are about 52 unbundled powers based on the uh, constitutional provision uh, of the powers that should be devolved to the Bangsamoro. And this is where I think many of our legislators either did not understand or were using their arguments for political purposes, although they should be able to understand that the Bangsamoro uh, Autonomous Region is a unique experiment on giving powers to LGUs that are as close to federalism as possible. That's what it is. Now, we, uh, the, I think uh, the legislators, particularly Senator Marcus, is saying, well, you know, they must follow the local government code. But it's wrong. Because under Article 10, there are two kinds of LGUs. There is the ordinary LGUs that's governed by the local government code, and there are the special autonomous regions of Cordilleras and Bangsamoro that will be that will be that will be the subject of new of organic laws of their own. So there are two types of local government. They don't necessarily and they don't conflict with each other. The powers are already there in the constitution. So I don't understand why they're saying that. There is no way you can have a Bangsamoro unless you have federalism. If you just give the powers that are in the constitution already to Bangsamoro, that's enough for the Bangsamoro people. Now, why do you need a federalism uh, under the constitution? I think what they mean is that unless you give or devote more powers to other government, uh, L other LGUs, then the Congress, which is dominated by other LGUs, will not pass the Bank of Oral That's a political issue, not a constitutional issue. Are you optimistic that the setup of Congress, the incoming uh, Congress, will be able to comprehend the issues therein for the Bank of Oral basically? Well, if you look at the experience uh, of the Bank of Oral, Bank of Oral Bill, uh, it seems that either people did not understand or did not want to understand. But the, the refrain that I'm hearing from congressmen like Congressman Lobregat is that why should they get powers that we don't have? If they're going to get, get these powers, we should also get these powers. But that is precisely why there are express provisions in the Constitution saying this is a special autonomous region that we must, we must give to the morals. Why? Because in the history of our country, the, our Muslim brothers and sisters are the only ethnic group that developed without foreign influence. They refused to come foreign influence. The Christian majority 
they accept the, the Spaniards and the, and the Americans, uh, colonial powers, right? But the, the Muslims did not. And I think instead of punishing them for that, we should celebrate it. And we should give them the kind of identity and powers that they deserve for being that, for, be, for be developing on their own. Because it's a good experiment for us. If it succeeds in Muslim Mindanao, with 3.6 million people in a small area, then it can work everywhere else. But we have to prove that it works in Muslim Mindanao by merely implementing the Constitution without changing it. Okay. So it only goes to prove that we don't need the Americans to protest. We don't need anybody but ourselves. Thank you. How does the BBL sound to the businessmen like the Philippine export sports group? Well, uh, as, uh, as far as I know, uh, we have some uh, talks about that. Uh, even many of our members uh, in, in, in the now were not in favor of it. So, generally, generally, uh, I think the, the BCI generally they are not in favor of it. Why? Why? Well, they, 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 they probably maybe that understanding fully, but, uh, but uh, basically I think there are some provisions which they feel uh, are, are not, uh, well, constitutional or could be problematic. Okay, can I just, Please. you know, the business community was heavily represented in the Peace Council that was put together by President Aquino, and they fully were subscribed to the Bangsamoro uh, Autonomous Region creation. In fact, there are many recommendations there. And in fact, my problem was that the cluster on the economy uh, concentrated too much on what business wants rather than what the Muslim deserve. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and there is a big difference there. Now, of course, if you ask in general, there will be more people against it. One, because they don't have the power, and secondly, they don't trust. It's really a question of trust. They don't trust that our Muslim brothers and sisters uh, will stay autonomous. They say, "Oh no, no, that's just another step to cessation." They forget that when the uh, when the Bangsamoro is created with the commitment of territory and sovereign uh, intact in the Philippines, it, it gives them, you know, it gives them less less standing in the international community to secede. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Well, thank you for the clarification. We have questions from the media. I would like to acknowledge our friends from GMA7, uh, CNN, TV, and Channel 5. They're here. And our friends from uh, Kyoto and some other agencies. Questions from the media. Let's have the questions now. Okay. Please. Please identify yourself and the entity you come from. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone, and you with a good smile of BWPL. Uh, as we all know, President Duterte uh, likes to revive the death penalty. But the Vice President, uh, the future Vice President, Robredo, uh, don't like it. So do you think it will be a good government if most leaders are not in favor of the same, same, uh, uh, same program. Death penalty. Yeah, program. <laughs> death penalty. How does it sound to you, uh, Doctor Burgess? So my stand is that um, if one has earned but he was given his chance in court and found guilty, he must pay. But it is not for us to take the life of a person. Yun po ang, yun ang stand ko. So uh, I hope that if, if uh, 
the, pres the future president is serious about this, he would first consult people, not just, uh, you know, uh, he, he has been sending the message that what he likes he will get, what he wants he will do. I want to believe that that will not be so when he is president. I want, I hope that he will first consult and find out from the different faith, from everybody, what the position is. Yes, there are crimes which are heinous, there are crimes which, uh, but I think the death penalty is even more charitable than staying in jail for all your life. Okay, can I, can I just Yes, please. It's more charitable, you but I can alone, you can It's an easy way to get out of suffering. I'm sorry, can I just say, because the provision of the Constitution here, I'm, I'm the one who, who put that there. And at the time, during the deliberations of the, uh, of the provision, there was a very strong voice for abolishing death penalty on the ground that the evidence shows it has not really prevented crimes from happening. But it was a very difficult vote, uh, with for and against. So they said maybe we should uh, we should uh, uh, put this, you know, the get language there that uh, that gives some opening. And they asked me to draft it. So <laughs> when it says. Excessive fines shall not be imposed or cruel, degrading, inhuman, uh, inhuman uh, uh, punishment uh, uh, imposed. And it says, neither shall uh, the death penalty uh, uh, be imposed. Uh, and I put the words, uh, unless, uh, except for uh, for compelling reasons involving heinous crimes when congress will bring back the uh, bring back the death uh, 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 so uh, that's how it is yeah. now what happened <laughs> what, what happened was that congress did enough law to bring back uh, death penalty for certain crimes but if you read the crimes that they enumerated, it's more than what was in the original penal code. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they went overboard on the kinds of uh, crimes that can be punished with the death penalty, which was not the intent of the Constitutional Commission. So during the Arroyo administration, uh, in, uh, for the visit of the President to the Vatican, they passed a law that's, that uh, superseded and eliminated uh, the the law uh, and went back to the uh, to the abolition of the death penalty. That's the history. So today, I think uh, this will cause is correct. Why don't we ask the people exactly what what they need as consultations and present them with the studies? What are the data that's happened to other countries and even to ourselves? Because we had a period where it was being punished again. And then it was out again, and now there's no death penalty again. Okay, so let me ask you then, uh, what do you foresee in as much as Mr. Duterte got elected because of his campaign against criminality? Yes. yes. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean you need the death penalty. It may mean that you have to implement the laws justly. The problem is that we had a very flawed justice system. They were very, you know, our, our justice system really needs repair uh, because, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you take a look even at why foreign investors come to a country, it's very interesting. You know, your primary, secondary, tertiary, but in the area of tertiary, like services, it says that one of the factors for whether people are going to invest or not is whether the justice system is fair. That's interesting. Okay, that's nice. Thank you for uh, the addendum. But they say in the Philippines, if the parties cannot settle the case manicably and the fiscal fails to fix the case, the judge may have no other option but to business the case. You know, that's, 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 that's uh, sad. Yeah, but I, I don't think uh, 
we should decide on constitutional provisions on adding total comments. Yes, of course. Yeah. Sabi nga, we need the proof. Yeah. Of course. Stop. Yeah. We would just like us to cite the case of Jonas. When he disappeared, the first thing that our lawyer did was to apply for the writ of habeas corpus. It took the, con the Court of Appeals six years to grant the petition. Habeas corpus para nga masave yung tao. After six years, ano pa ba ang chance mo makuhang buhay yung tao? Yeah. So, I obtained justice, yes. I even got complete writ of habeas. Amparo, nakuha ko yun. But that was only after six years. That's the justice system here. In other countries, if it's habeas corpus, mabilis, mabilis, mabilis. Kasi nga, kailangan pakita mong buhay yung tao. Even after proving that the vehicle upon which he was uh, pushed into was found in, in a camp. Ako mismo, I went to that camp, I saw the vehicle, and the car plate, which was supposed to be attached to that, was seen by several witnesses. Even with that evidence, it still took six, six years to prove that it was an enforced disappearance case. Really? Wow. Okay. We have anything to say about the death penalty, uh, Mr. Serio, Mr. Mr. Well, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to death penalty, but uh, I think from from the campaign period and from the pronouncement of uh, the incoming president about the summary killing, and people are willing to accept that. I think if you take a policy, you will get a big majority of the people to agree with that penalty. Please. <laughs> my, my understanding is that at the beginning of the campaign, uh, Mr. Duterte was talking about it's okay to kill when uh, when when your justice system fails, and he was finally convinced by PDP Laban to say instead of instead of saying that, can you just say that you want to restore? the death penalty. It was a political uh, uh, move on the part of the death that to say from now on that it, the death penalty should be restored. Now, now is the time to really study deeply the problem. Okay. You were in China, uh, Chito, for some decades. Death penalty was imposed. Uh, how did it sound to you? Did it stop crimes uh, in China? Please use this microphone. <laughs> Sorry for the debate. In China, very little debate on the death penalty. It's been the practice for a long time. And as to whether it promotes deterrence or not, the fact that they still need a very strong anti corruption campaign right now leads me to think that. It may be effective to a certain degree, but not on all uh, crimes, you know, for example, corruption. They have, as a matter of fact, in China, China has the record, the world's record of the, the biggest number or the most number of executions. executions. And uh, the, they're trying now to, and, and this has been a problem in their international image, so what they're trying to do now, they move from the use of uh, musketry, you know, they would shoot the, the back of the, of, the, of the head and charge the cause of the bullet to the family of the victim. Now they do it by lethal, lethal injection. They're moving in that direction. So supposedly a more humane version of the death penalty. Uh, no hazard. So, so, however, it is probably, China is probably a negative example. It's, it's something you don't want to follow and go in that direction. Kasi nagkaroon sila ng quota, eh. Down to the provinces, how many should be eliminated in one of those campaigns. It became a campaign. Uh, well, so, the question here is really how to balance our own values and at the same time, how to prevent you know, heinous crimes. And it's going to be a big debate, I think, in the Philippines. Yeah, uh, I understand uh, the maker of Viagra, Pfizer, 
has already made the statement that they don't want their drugs to be used in lethal injections. Uh, they would rather have it some other way. Uh, Mr. Monsat, would you care to ask me? Okay, okay. All right. Uh, we understand. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, from uh, Kyoto. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, I have one question for Mr. Santaroman. Santaroman, yes. About the, the foreign policy. So, uh, the Duterte administration. You said that it's, it doesn't seem final yet, but from the likes of it, uh, it seems like the Philippines will adopt a more, or uh, a less adversarial stance to China. If that does indeed happen, um, what scenario do you think will happen to the Philippines? I mean, do we stop losing territories? And do you think it's the more prudent uh, approach here in this case? <laughs> That's the key question. <laughs> let, let me try to answer it in a simple way. No? On the one hand, nakasala na eh, yung arbitration case. So I think this will fall on the incoming administration. And I think it's too late to do anything to withdraw or anything like that. I, I don't see that happening. I think what will happen is that we wait for the decision of the arbitration. However, as I've said here before in the same forum, it is not a slam dunk. No? There are a lot of news reports saying that we will definitely win. I wish this would be the case. However, I want to add a note of caution. Any arbitration tribunal for those uh, for law lawyers and legal experts have told me they tend to go down the middle. And in the case of the arbitral tribunal that we're facing, I think you can expect them to uphold the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. They will try to uphold UNCLOS to make sure that the principles are followed. How they will do it is the question. And an example of them going down the middle is the decision on jurisdiction. The Philippines, if you study the case, is asking for 15 counts. Fifteen counts. They said they have jurisdiction on seven. So this is already an example, no? Half or less than half. And for the rest, they said it depends when we go to the merits of the case. Now, from for the Philippines, and, and I don't want to get too technical, but there are actually two two critical issues. One is the question of the nine dash line, and this is related to the whole issue of China's assertion of its historic rights. So, how do you claim maritime jurisdiction? Can it be on the basis of history, which China claims, or only on the basis of UNCLOS? Because if UNCLOS lang, your nine dash line will be much smaller. It depends on whether there are islands there. And from there, you start from the land and you count your 12 miles or 200 miles. No? So, you know, critical issue for the Philippines. If we get the nine dash line, the key question is what will they say about historic rights? If they say it has been extinguished, then it's a big victory for us. If they say that the nine dash line cannot be a claim to territorial rights or territorial waters, that's, I think, to be expected and a big victory for us. But if they say that the nine dash line is only valid under one definition, not as a claim for territorial or maritime jurisdiction, but only to delineate a claim to the territorial features, then you would have a vague uh, victory or a halfway victory. The second big issue is the question of rock versus island. I mean, this sounds almost like a song. Is when is an island an island and when is a rock like a rock? A rock. Important, this is important because if they say there is at least one island, then it is entitled to 200 miles then we have an overlapping EEC with whoever owns the island and China claims 
all the islands in the South China Sea. If they say, if they uphold the Philippine position that all of these are rocks, that these are all only entitled to 12 miles territorial sea and not to 200 miles, or even no entitlement because it is submerged part of the time, then we have no overlapping EEC. There is no dispute with China on overlapping EEC because the Chinese claim there is an overlapping EEC because they count 200 miles from the Spratlys, not from Hainan or Guangdong. No? So yun ang isang heart of the issue that we have to see. Now the Taiwanese did something that actually hurts our interests recently. In March, they sub the Taiwan Society for International Law submitted an amicus curate brief to the International Tribunal saying that Ituaba or Taiping Island, the largest natural, naturally formed feature in the Spratlys, they claim is an island because it has a natural source of water, supposedly 60 tons a year. The Taiwanese claim, and I think it's slightly exaggerated, the avian quality in too big dot. No? Therefore, and that they have papaya, banana trees there, and that they can support uh, some form of uh, you know, agriculture, and therefore feed a certain amount of population. If the court upholds this, that there is at least one island, it's a big blow to the Philippines. It becomes an issue of overlapping EEC, and therefore a question of maritime delimitation. It's a technical term for saying maritime boundary. But maritime delimitation or boundary, it is outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal, and it becomes subject, and because the Chinese opted out if the issue uh, is opted out of compulsory arbitration, if the issue is a maritime delimitation issue, it becomes subject now to bilateral negotiation with the Chinese. But who do you negotiate with? You cannot negotiate with Taiwan, which controls it because of our one China policy. And if you negotiate with China, the Taiwanese will object. So it's going to be very complicated depending on what the ruling is. So you have to wait for the ruling and how it is worded to be able to claim victory. And if the, if the court divides, they say 9-9 cannot be, cannot, is illegal under UNCLOS, but there is an island, you actually have a very complicated situation. It is a halfway house for us. So you have to wait. And this will fall on the Duterte administration. Second, and, and this is the bigger point I want to make, because your, your question is, what will happen? I think it is possible when, after the, the third administration gets all the briefings and after the arbitration ruling is announced, there will be a policy review. There has to be. And then you proceed then on, based on the clarification, what the arbitration ruling will achieve is it will clarify the legal issue. On that basis, if the, the third administration wants to proceed in bilateral talks, then here you have you have a basis based on the ruling on what gives us legal leverage and what also we have we can talk about with China. So bilateral talks, the important thing is what do you talk about? <laughs> it is very clear he wants to talk about economic cooperation. On the question of the sovereignty and the, the territorial issue and the maritime delimitation issue. But the sovereignty issue, the tribunal cannot solve this. Because the sovereignty issue is not covered by UNCLOS. It is covered by general international law. So that will not be solved. That will remain to be a problem. And because the Chinese are not willing to submit it to the International Court of Justice, it's really, you do it through bilateral talks unless you can persuade the Chinese to agree to some form of mediation, conciliation, or whatever. So Mahabaya, and, and that's the point I want to make. To solve the sovereignty issue with the Chinese, if you look at their historical experience, the two cases where they've been able to solve it in recent decades has been the case of the Vietnamese. This is the, the border issue with Vietnam and the Gulf of Tonkin. They were able to define the border. 
And the second one is with Russia, with the Soviet Union or Russia now. It's the case of the Usuri River, and this is the the river, the border uh, river between the river uh, defining the border between China and Russia. In both cases, they had limited war. In the case of Vietnam, they had the border war. In the case of the Soviet Union, they had the border clashes. Under uh, in the case of Vietnam, it was under Deng Xiaoping. In the case of the Soviet Union, it was Mao. The Chinese experience, yeah, Mao, when the border clashes in 69. With the Chinese, the experience is this. If you insist on forcing them on a sovereignty issue, you run the danger of war or patigasan. They will stick to their ground and they won't give up. They will say every inch they will defend. And so Mao took that position with Brezhnev. And in the case of this of Vietnam, it was only after the border war. Actually, it was only after the Soviet Union's collapse, and therefore they could not rely on the Soviet Union, that the Vietnamese leadership changed and said, let's negotiate with China. And it took them a decade before they could delineate the border. And the Chinese agreed 50-50. So it is only when you improve political relations that it becomes easier to solve sovereignty and maritime boundary issues. The same case with the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed and Brezhnev, of course, died, and then you had Yeltsin, that they were able to have good relations with between China and Russia, and then eventually they subdivided down the middle of the river, and there was an island, Hinati Dinila 50-50. So the basic lesson from Chinese, from the his, recent history of China, it is only when you have good political relations that the Chinese become willing to divide 50-50. The more you insist, the more the harder they become on the other side. The softer you are, the more you become reasonable and friendly to them, the more they're willing to get enter into a settlement and negotiation. So unfortunately, there's a paradox here. The more you insist, the more they uh, push back. And the more you open bilateral talks, you could actually open the path to a negotiated settlement. Okay. Thank you. Would you care to add, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> He is the expert. But in international law, sometimes they render decisions with the principle they call uh, constructive ambiguity. So it's possible, as Sita said, that part of the decisions will have sections like this that are, that are uh, then using the principle of constructive ambiguity, and then the, the, the other paths are open. Uh, <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yes. Uh, from uh, CNN, Philippines. Yes, please. Well, I'm fine. Uh, <coughs> you mentioned earlier that the the, 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 the administrations, uh, sorry, one side, the, 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 the administration should, should think deeply about the possible consequences of uh, opening up the the constitution. So your first question is: Is the country ready to once again open and amend the constitution? Is the country ready? And second, what is the worst possible scenario that could happen if we do open our constitution? And I think that uh, the reason why I'm advocating that uh, they really study this deeply is because of the problem that the Constitutional Convention once convened has a life of its own. And the question is who will control that? Which interests will be dominant in a Constitutional Convention? And if you take a look at the profile of our present Congress, this will be the political dynasties. And you know, a parliamentary system, especially combined especially with the federal system, enforces or reinforces the dominance of clans and dynasties at the local level. So, so we, we may, in fact, if you look at this and people say, well, this is really empowerment to the local government, uh, you're devolving power to as near to the people as possible, that sounds good. But the question is, does that power filter down to the people themselves? Or are they kept 
by the clans and the political dynasties at the local level. In which case, then you, you get at the adverse consequences rather than the benefits of a constitutional convention. That's, that's the reason why I think we should really think about this. And you know, if you take a look at the Article 10, Article 10 allows local governments to voluntarily get together in order to integrate their, their functions, their planning, their resources, and so on. And right now, you have the two Negros, Negros Occidental and Negros Oriental, already doing this. So it's important, I think, from the point of view when we start when we start dividing up regions. There are all kinds, 11 regions, 15 regions, 5 regions, and so on. I, isn't it better if we start from the bottom and say, why don't we give the people who vote for themselves to get together to see if it works? Because one of the things that I think will arise here is that when you when a constitutional convention of two, three hundred people is start putting boundaries on regions and provinces, that there will be a lot of people who say we don't agree to that. Whereas if you start from a voluntary association integrating their functions and resources, then you know where the natural tendencies are of the people. Why not? If we're going to give power to the people, then put it down as low, bring it down to as low level as possible. Otherwise, you will have again this central institution that will again dictate to the LGUs how to define boundaries. Today, under the Constitution, local governments can actually create, divide, and so on areas, and it has to be approved by Congress, and there has to be a plebiscite. So that's the that's the the process today in the constitution, the mechanism. So my, my suggestion is take a look at what powers you really want for the LGUs, and then allow things to happen on a voluntary basis to see whether there is a, there is logic and consistency on what's being done, instead of a once and for all uh, solution, you know, a, a quick solution that's a quick wrong solution that's going to be hard to reverse. Um, follow up now on the death penalty, because we were talking about death penalty earlier. And I think the proposal of uh, presumptive president Duterte is that it is death penalty by hanging in public. What do you think of that one? <laughs> <laughs> Let me add fuel to the fire. The question is, how would we start in the international community? Would we be another Pakistan or Bangladesh? But, you know, I think generally in the world today, there is a tendency to say let's abolish the, the death penalty because precisely all the studies that have been done showing that it may not really be that much of a deterrent. Uh, but I think people have been very impatient with our justice system. And it's true, they should be impatient. The question is, can we do it in a shortcut, a shortcut way and you know, a sudden change like this, will it really achieve the objective we want? And, and that I am not sure. Because in the, fir in the first place, by the way, the Constitution prohibits inhuman punishment, right? That's, that's in the same provision where the death the, uh, penalty was abolished. Inhuman punishment, yes. Cruel and an unusual punishment. So, pun Is, so death penalty by having in public won't be no. Well, I, actually, as, as, as Tito said, the quick way is really by lethal injection. I mean, to, to at least spare the, uh, the, the, the person the, the suffering uh, that we are hanging. He can be hanging there for a couple of minutes or hours. That's really painful death. Uh, but, can I raise a question before you end? Because, uh, we're talking about charter change, and I'd like to raise this to business. Yeah. Shortly before the end of the Aquino administration, the Foreign Chambers of Commerce uh, submitted a list of reforms, am I correct, to the President saying you must do this before your term ends, and this will really cap the achievements of your administration. And among, among these reforms, I don't know, 15, 18 reforms, were three reforms that was uh, suggested by the Chambers of Commerce 
and, and endorsed by the Makati Business Club, the Management Association of the Philippines, and if I remember correctly, the PCCI. You did not. You did not. Okay. It was really Makati Business Club. Okay. And, and among these three are number one, terminate agrarian reform. Number two, uh, change the constitutional provisions or nationalistic provisions. And the, what they were advocating was the proposal of Speaker uh, Speaker Bermonte that in six provisions of the Constitution that have these nationalistic provisions, just add the phrase, unless otherwise provided by law. Therefore, taking out the restrictions and the process in the Constitution and putting it in the hands of Congress. They can put it up or down, whatever they want to do with it. That's the one. And the third is they said, please resume uh, uh, the uh, mining, you know, giving mining uh, concessions uh, even before the, the reform law is passed by Congress that changes the fiscal regime and imposes in the evaluation of mining projects the externalities or adverse adverse environmental effects of mining. Can you imagine? Those three was endorsed by the Makati Business Club. And therefore, I like it when President or Mr. Duterte, presumptive President Duterte, said that I will not, I will not, uh, you know, I will not obey or whatever, follow the recommendations of the oligarchs in Makati Business Club. I agree totally with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, please use the microphone. Uh, a reaction from the business sector. But they did not endorse it, unfortunately. Uh, they, we, we did not endorse it. Normally we co sign with them. But the main reason really was more of uh, the Belmonte, uh, which we thought is something that we may have to live in, live with in the future. And we didn't want the foreign chambers to be delving in our constitution. And I, I think that's that's bad, because we will be here uh, by the time if, if you're opening the door for changes in constitution by that but by, by that simple thing, and and yet uh, the the foreign chambers were pushing it, and we said, well, you won't be here, but you will be here if the, if a if a if a, if a another uh, Congress comes in and wants to change other thing by this way. We will be the one to suffer. You, 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 we do it. That's why we did it. I agree with that. Really, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. One or two more questions from the floor? Yes, please. Uh, I'm uh, Lingoy Alguas of Opinion. Uh, the question? Two points. Huh? Two points. One, on uh, finance, uh, regarding federalism, uh, on finances and uh, checks and balances. On finances, uh, my impression is that more revenue is generated in Metro Manila than in other regions on a per capita basis. Right now, under the present uh, system of government, the central government may allocate to different regions, provinces down the line, extra resources. Now, in the case of uh, Mindanao, they always cry out against Imperial Manila. But that is a wrong term to use. It should be Imperial Malacanang and not Manila. Because the moment we, we are federal, we citizens of NCR might finally have the resources to fix up our traffic problem. If you understand my point, uh, I'd like to ask a comment on that. But may I go to the second point? The second point is that uh, no matter how powerful, authoritarian uh, president may be, the national media cannot be cowed. On the other hand, I have seen in my travels, in, uh, sometimes as a media relations for a candidate or sometimes as an advanced party, how quick and easily cowed by threats and by money uh, the regional, provincial, city, local media. So, may I, comment, uh, may I invite a comment on whether you expect that under the federal situation, the local media will also grow 
just as we expect the <coughs> local governments to grow. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't really know, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there will be disparity in the economic uh, situation of, of the different uh, regions. And kung taga Manila ako, eh bakit naman ako papayag na you want autonomy, why will I have to pay for it? No? So, and, and the national government won't have the wherewithal to, to be able to support you. Well, in, in regards to, uh, to, the, to the media, uh, I don't know if it will be any different except that uh, uh, I think the national, the national papers, the broadsheets, will still be the same. They will be run by, but uh, I don't know if it will be any different. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, please. I am. Uh, I think that uh, our media should not be owned by people in business, because uh, if I read what happens in the newspapers, it's pro-business most of the time, and money talks. You know, if you look at the history of our country, the problem, the studies show that the main problem are the policies and the flawed institutions of government, and that's been going on for. 60 years now, 50 years, from, from 1960 to 2009. And the main issue is corruption and political dynasties. And the question is, who has the money in order to, uh, you know, that produces corruption and that produces political dynasties? It's the business community. So it is what they call the iron law of orthodoxy, the combination of uh, corrupt by uh, legislators and business now so if business controls media or most of the media which is happening today we have a problem we have a problem thank you very much for bringing that up however uh as you may know uh the debates uh during the campaign season uh, were not as expected because most of the moderators were very kind to the candidates. But that is a side comment, anyway. We're pressed for time and time to solicit the closing statements ng ating mga kasama. Esto, uh, may statements si Ninang Edith in a short while. So let's start with business. What do you expect from the Duterte administration? Uh, what do you think should be done? What should be the priority aside from press releases? Well, uh, as I said, we submitted some of our economic uh, uh, formulas uh, and uh, we probably in soon will be consulting with the, with the presidential group no, uh, re regarding this. But uh, let, let me just say this, no? and I think it's the opinion of many other things. Uh, we, we are looking at uh, whether the new administration will succeed based on, on his promises. There are 12 billion OFWs. And that's why, and you will divide by about five, five family, and you have 60 million that are uh, really old W families. Now, if I, if I uh, my the father is in uh, is in Hong Kong, his main concern is my daughter is not raped, my son does not become an addict. Everything else is secondary. So I tell you. If the president succeeds, not in three months, not in six months, but there is a showing that he's able to curb this crime in the cancer of way, I tell you, everybody will be with him. And uh, and he and media will not be able to influence anybody. Uh, people will be with him if he's able to show that because the big majority of our people already are fed up. Thank you. Sita. What to expect from the incoming administration? I guess what what uh, we're expecting is a more coherent, a clearer idea of the direction of the foreign policy. He has given some indications, but he's also <coughs> changed on some of them. So I think there is a lot of uh, questions in different capitals around the world, particularly Washington and Beijing, and even <laughs> in Manila. So I think what is expected is a 
a direction that will protect the country's national interests and improving relations with the different countries, the different neighbors, and the different powers, and yet maintaining an independent foreign policy. You think uh, we can have that independent foreign policy? The nature of independence is a question of degree. Okay? Right now, we are very reliant on the U.S. for defense. And, and there, is, there is a logic to that. Because in the face of a, a big neighbor that is bullying us, and we cannot defend ourselves, so we rely on another one. However, that is not the only option. And this is shown already by the Vietnamese, the Indonesians, the Malaysians, and other neighbors in Southeast Asia, where you could have a more independent posture and yet enjoy the treaty alliance with the U.S. and at the same time be on friendly terms with the different powers in the region and not be part of uh, an alliance that is concentrated, for example, against China. So I think this is the key, because now there is a perception gap. From our point of view, China is the bully. From the Chinese point of view, we are the pawn of the US. Uh, and, and so this is a, a challenge, because any president that becomes, that wants to survive in the Philippines, you have to protect your back, and to protect your back by maintaining, by reassuring the Americans that you will not shift the alliance to China. But it does not mean you will shift the alliance. You can still remain a U.S. ally, like Japan, being a U.S. ally, and at the same time being able to talk and trade with China. That is something we have not done in the past couple of years. We've decided, in a sense, to be more popish than the Pope. You know, we decided to cut off or almost freeze the bilateral ties and then just proceed and rely on the U.S. There is also a phenomenon that may happen in November. There is a close election happening in the U.S. And if you have Trump on the other side, <laughs> you, it will be quite a combination between Trump and Duterte here and how the geopolitics will be affected. So I think, I think the key, though, for the Philippines is to proceed from our own national interests and how to achieve peace and prosperity and yet not being involved in the war or the growing strategic rivalry between the two superpowers, the two powers. Yeah, Chito, are you saying that we are up for some interesting times, but interesting in Chinese is more of a curse than a blessing? Yeah. We will certainly go through interesting times in the coming future. <laughs> is it a blessing or a curse? It depends on how the incoming administration will maneuver in the South China Sea. Because the South China Sea now is the concentrated, it's the cockpit, the main cockpit of strategic rivalry between US and China. Somehow their interests collide in the South China Sea. And the key for us is not to be drawn into a military conflict. And I think the two sides are also trying to avoid it. But how to maneuver, and this is going to be the challenge for the incoming administration. Mm -hmm. May it have the pragmatism and the statesmanship to see how to be able to maneuver for the benefit of the Filipino people. Yes. Yes, sir. I, I, I think uh, we should uh, really watch what the Duterte administration uh, is going to do and measure accomplishments according to promises. Now, what are the promises? Number one, that there will be a substantial reduction in the next six months on crime and corruption. That's a promise. So the question is, can he fulfill that promise? And now we have an additional one, a change from a unitary to a federal government in the next two years. Uh, now, the Kilo administration has already said that it's going to follow or continue uh, some of the good works done by the Aquino administration. The Duterte administration said that some of the Aquino gains are, are, should be continued. That's the conditional cash transfer, the, the improvements in the health, public health uh, on the uh, coverage, 
and that now it better at uh, kindergarten, even before grade one. We're now, we're now uh, touching our uh, children, which is really good, because that's the formative years, right? Now, the, the, with that, the question is that the poor expects uh, the new Duterte administration to implement or fulfill the revolution that they've been waiting for, and that's a social justice revolution. It's not about the structure of government, of federalism, or 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 kinds of parliamentarism. So I think yeah, the, the, that the administration should study this very closely, because those two big promises about crime corruption and a change in the, the federalism may be contradictory to each other when you look at the possible consequences to the poor and the marginalized will be uh, when you shift to a federal system. Uh, now, the thing, the last point is that I think people are now examining and not just taking uh, at face value the quality of the cabinet members. Because particularly in the next two years, if indeed we will be concentrating on structural changes in our country, on constitution and all that, who will mind the storm? There's a lot of things to be done on social justice revolution. And if we are preoccupied for two to three years on just changing the structure of the government, uh, who will actually implement and do most of the things? They're the cabinet members. How good are they? Do they reflect actually the best and the brightest? Or do they reflect political accommodation? Mm -hmm. Okay, very well said. Dr. Edith Burgos, please. And be ready with the picture. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Melo. Um, all the points have been, um, have been thoroughly explained. The new president wants to address crime and he would like to eliminate, in his own words, crime within three to six months. Disappearance is also criminalized now. Just last December, the anti-disappearance law was passed. We are the only country in Asia with an anti-disappearance law. So that falls under this crusade. Crusade to eliminate crime. Also to stop and force disappearance. So we will be up against institutions who have been used by the state to commit and force disappearance. And of course, in our case, crusaders against the unforced disappearance, we are in a sort of wait and see because also during the election time, the president, the uh, presumptive president Duterte, has also made statements, something like, well, if they arrest me because of my statement, on, on the rape thing, then I will also dissolve the Commission on Human Rights. I, I, I saw that, I heard that in, in one of his interviews. You know, his, his uh, comments, which I don't think he think about, impulsive uh, comments, but now when he sits as president, we hope that it is not only corruption, drugs, uh, criminality, that he should address, but also the very root of the reason why there are enforced disappearances, exhibitional killings, which is poverty. It's a long discussion, but I think we all understand why. My son was lived like a farmer, helped farmers. He was involved indeed with the left. He was involved with the underground. But there are things, there are ways to do these things. If he compared, he should have been arrested, he should have had his day in court, but instead he was disappeared. So if indeed the president now, the new president is sincere, he will not only address criminality per se, kill criminals, but look at the very root of why they are they're stealing, they're killing. And look at uh, the, the intentions of those who err. If they're sincere and they really want to help others, then there would be different ways of dealing with them and not killing them. My crusade right now, along with the Asian Federation Against Disappearance, 
is for the Philippines to sign the International Convention protecting people from being disappeared. We have a law, but we have not signed the International Convention. If this is signed, then us victims will have a, another opening for us to bring our case to. For example, my case has been decided by the Supreme Court that after that, there's nowhere else that I can go. No international court of justice would take up the case because it's not a case against humanity. It's, these are not uh, war cases. So, parang nasa na ako, pero wala ako punta. But if this is signed, then all other victims of enforced disappearance would have still another venue where they can bring the case so they can recover the disappeared. Mm -hmm. So, we may be ambassadors in chains, but we must speak up because if and when our disappeared surface, we wouldn't want them to remember our silence rather than the voices of their enemies. Yeah, show us the Thank pictures. You. Oh yes, I, I brought this in case you haven't, those of you who haven't heard about the case of my son, Jonas. He has been disappeared for nine years. Last April 28 was the ninth, ninth year of his abduction. He looks like his father without the glasses. And I really hope that President Duterte would give hope not only to the peace-loving people, but to victims themselves like us. Thank you. Well, okay, began on that note, we end our presentation uh, this morning. We'll, we'll be up for another exciting Monday. Uh, we will talk about the national fruit next week. We will talk about balimbings and the like. And how, uh, you know, how the political cauldron will boil. So thank you very much, Chito. Please stay for a couple of minutes more. And then uh, I'm going to give the uh, Commissioner, uh, uh, Dr. Burgos, and of course, Serutis Lewis Jr. Thank you for not forgetting this event. And to the members of the Diplomatic Corps, have a nice day.